Namaskar. I would like to request the chairpersons to kindly introduce our speaker. Once again, good afternoon, sir. Please do not try in OT as well as your endoscopy rooms this particular exercise. <laughs> right. So, do I have the privilege to introduce him? Can we have that slide, please? Thank you. Hi. So, sir is in Padma Shri, Dr. Amit Mayadev, given by President of India in 2013, winner of World Cup endoscopy in 2012 at Chicago, 25 years experience in clinical practice, pioneer of video endoscopy. As an MBBS student, we've really heard your names are always interventional endoscopy also, and he's been presidents of so many societies across India and outside. Over to you, sir. The stage is yours. So th thank you so much. I would like to first uh, thank Dr. Sachin Chittawar and Mohit for giving me this opportunity. It's a great honor. It's a superbly organized conference, and it's the first time I'm seeing such an interactive audience. So as you must have gathered from my short CV, I am a also a surgeon by training, but it was 30 years back that I gave up surgery. In fact, on the day, the day I became a surgeon, next year I gave up surgery. And that was because of my love of interventional endoscopy. And over the last 30 years, I've been practicing the speciality of interventional endoscopy. And lately, over the last decade or so, the new speciality, which is on the horizon, that is flexible endoscopic surgery. In fact, that is exactly the reason which pushed me into this new field of bariatric and metabolic endoscopy. Uh, the first slide is, of course, going to be very elementary for the audience here, because I can see stalwart physicians, endocrinologists sitting here. So this is not something which I'm supposed to talk about. But obesity and metabolic problems in our country literally have become like a pandemic. And it is uh, what you see in this slide is not very uncommon to see. In fact, if you were to check the BMI of the people sitting here in the audience itself, except for the back rows where we have a lot of youngsters, I'm quite sure a significant proportion of those of us sitting here will have definitely an abnormal BMI, and which probably is going to deserve some attention. Now, what is very, very important to note is calculation of BMI, how the person looks, whether the person is really obese. In the Indian and the Asian population, obesity is a little bit different. Uh, obesity does not necessarily mean that the person is looking extremely fat, but we have to understand, in, especially in Indians, obesity predominantly affects the central part of the body. And if you see, many people who are so-called obese in the country have got pot bellies, they have got tummies which are coming out, and most of the times it is visceral obesity. There is obesity, that is fat collecting around the organs, intra-abdominal organs, and therefore if you see this new classification of BMI, and what does obesity cause or increased BMI lead to in the form of comorbidities, in the Asian and Indian population, even with a low BMI of, say, 23 to 25, these people are at increased risk of comorbidities. Uh, whereas from 25 to 30, there is a moderate risk of comorbidities. And even from a 30 BMI onwards, there is a severe risk of comorbidities. So even though an Indian person, he may not be looking actually fat, but because of the central obesity, the visceral obesity, their chances of developing comorbidities is extremely high. The next slide is going to give you some very, very important startling facts that why do we need to control the obesity? Why do we need to control the fat or the control the weight of the patient? If you were to see this, all the techniques which have been described, whether it is just simple diet and exercise or bariatric surgical techniques or what I'm going to talk to you about bariatric or metabolic endoscopic techniques, the aim of this is not to make that person uh, go and uh, participate in a beauty competition or, a, or a, you become a handsome person or a beauty queen. But all that we need to know or with all that we need to do is to control the weight to such an extent by which it will significantly reduce that person's chances of developing comorbidities in the future. 
For example, if you see here, how much amount of weight reduction is required actually to have a significant reduction of all these comorbidities. You see diabetes, hypertension, hyper dyslipidemia, HbA1c control, sleep apnea, or even say fatty liver problems which can occur, NAFLD, joint pains, etc. Overall, if you go to see, the average amount of total body weight loss required to significantly reduce comorbidities, even up to 90% reduction of comorbidities, is only 10%. So even if we can achieve a 10% reduction of total body weight, and it can be maintained, sustained in a long term, we can have a very good reduction of comorbidities. Now this was recognized by surgeons in our country many years back. And there is no wonder that so many bariatric surgical centers flourished in the country of India. In fact, the bariatric surgeons in our country have done an incredible job in view of offering various types of bariatric surgical procedures. They were just shown to us by Professor Phoebe. And with this, not only can we control the weight, we can reduce the weight, but we can very well also control uh, the metabolic syndrome, which is setting in. Uh, in spite of so many different surgeries being uh, practiced, still the commonest practiced surgical procedure is a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. And as rightly put by Professor Phoebe, the main reason is the simplicity of doing a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy as compared to doing multiple anastomosis, multiple staple lines with their chances of comorbidities, or co chances of morbidity after the surgery, or chances of leaks which can lead to serious adverse events. And you see here, even though statistics states that the morbidity of overall of bariatric surgery is around 30%, it can lead to post-operative leaks, it can lead to various issues. Bariatric surgeons, some of the bariatric surgeons in our country have really mastered the technique. In fact, I have myself been a witness to Mohit Bhandari operating, doing a, a very complex bariatric surgery. And when I saw the way he was doing the surgery, it was almost like playing a musical instrument. And to me, he did the procedure sometimes even simpler than what we do a simple upper GI endoscopy or a simple gastroscopy. So this is the state of bariatric surgery. The problem is that patients in our country and all over the world do not readily accept a surgical option. And in spite of the superb job being done by bariatric surgeons, the overall penetration rate or the convincing rate where, sur where patients can actually undergo the bariatric surgery is less than 1% in our country. And that is the reason why time has come now that we have to offer one another modality which can meet this unmet need. And probably, as you can see, as from my slides in the future, as I'm going to go ahead, bariatric endoscopy is likely to meet that unmet need for those patients who fall into the category, who are not overtly obese, they are not morbidly obese, they are getting scared of surgery, they are shying away from surgery, but they are slowly entering into a metabolic syndrome or various types of comorbidities. These are the patients where we can offer a moderate approach in the form of bariatric endoscopy. Now, over the last 30, 40 years or so, the only modality what flexible endoscopy could do to reduce weight is to place a balloon in the stomach. And the only thing we could do is to just put this inflatable balloon, which can be filled with water, and which can be mixed with some methylene blue, and we put it inside the stomach, and only because of a space-occupying effect in the stomach, the patient reduces the amount of food that the patient is eating, and thereby reduces the weight. In fact, you see this. These are statistics from Brazil. 40,000 procedures in the Brazilian intragastric balloon consensus statement. Reasonably good total body weight loss, 18.43 total body weight loss, very negligible adverse events. The problem is when we started placing these balloons in our country, we realized very soon that Indian people somehow don't tolerate balloons so well. And whenever we used to place a balloon, many of my patients used to come and plead to us that please take out my balloon, please take out my balloon, I'm having too much tightness in the stomach, I'm having too much of bloating and I can't tolerate it. So therefore, balloon placement became a little bit unpopular in our country. Not only that, we have to remember 
that as soon as you take out the balloon, because you can't keep the balloon in the stomach permanently, you take out the balloon, the stomach size is the same, the patient again starts eating the same amount of food, again weight regain starts, so it is at best a temporizing procedure. The whole picture of bariatric endoscopy changed because for the first time in the world, a device was invented which can be attached to the tip of a flexible scope and endoscopist could go inside the stomach with a flexible endoscope and we could actually perform suturing. And the, because of this, a technique which was invented by using this device, which was called as endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. Now in this technique, as you can see here, you can pass the flexible endoscope inside the stomach. You can see that's the big stomach. Then you go along the greater curvature. Sometimes we can do marking on the anterior wall of the stomach and also the posterior wall of the stomach. And then by using the suturing device, which is attached to the tip of the scope, we can take sutures in various patterns, starting from the anterior wall. This is almost like doing a pleating procedure. So we are actually pleating a cloth and it is also popularly called as the accordion procedure. And then by tightening the sutures, we can take full thickness bites starting from the anterior wall, on the greater curvature, on the posterior wall, and thereby we can actually pleat and reduce the size of the stomach by almost 50 to 60%. Obviously, because we are reusing a suturing material, a full thickness suture, this is uh, hopefully more durable than a simple balloon placement. Now this is how the whole thing works, this is how the instrument is, there are two towers, one here, one here. We can pull the wall of the stomach between the two towers and by using this needle, we can take a full thickness suture and thereby we can completely plicate the stomach. The first presentation on endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty was done in 2015 in the SAGES conference, you see here, it was a multi-center study and from this, at the average weight loss at six months after doing this procedure was 17 kilos. And you see here total body weight loss was maintained reasonably well at six months and later on also at the end of one year. The main advantage of this procedure over a surgical procedure was that this was done completely endoscopically, though it was done under general anesthesia. And the first case was described in 2013. But by doing this procedure, we could maintain the anatomic structure of the stomach. No part of the stomach was cut. The stomach innervation was maintained. The blood supply was maintained. The procedure is potentially reversible. It is reproducible. Any interventional endoscopist who has got reasonable experience in various types of procedures can perform this procedure. It can be repeated. In fact, we normally now we have formed a protocol that after performing the first endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty after seven or eight months if we find that the weight loss has plateaued we call these patients back we perform an endoscopy and if you find that some of the sutures have become a little loose or if the stomach is slightly expanding in certain areas we can go in and on an outpatient basis we can take two or three more augmentation sutures and thereby the stomach continues to remain small and the weight loss continues to progress it is extremely safe in all the studies which have been published in the world, there have been no serious adverse events, no mortality, and it is more durable than the balloon. And very importantly, in case we cannot achieve uh, the desired weight loss with this procedure, these patients can still be subjected to surgery. Now, how does this procedure work? The body of the stomach becomes a tube. We intentionally leave the fundus of the stomach intact. So the food preferentially goes and stays in the fundus of the stomach. The, sum, the fundus of the stomach distends and thereby that leads to gastroparesis. And the satiety improves, the patient feels hungry after six to seven hours. And if you were to see the endoscopic picture, this is exactly how the procedure is performed. You see here, this is a suturing device, that is a 2-0 proline. Now this is how we pull the stomach wall in between the two towers by using this screw type of device. So we rotate the screw, we go inside the wall of the stomach, pull the wall of the stomach between the two towers and by just pressing the handle, the needle goes through and through the wall and we can take the stitch. If you were to see over here, at the, as we progress in this procedure, we can tighten, we start somewhere just proximal to the incisor or angularis and we make the body of the stomach into a tube and at the end of the procedure, if you were to see here, on the left side you will see the normal stomach, whereas on the right side you see 
after the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. Uh, the stomach has become into a complete tube. We can perform imaging techniques later on to show how the stomach greater curvature has been plicated. Uh, Mohit and myself have combined our efforts together over the last two years. And you see here, this is our data. Over the last few years, we have done 203 patients starting from March 2017. Majority of our patients were female. Average BMI was 34. Average number of sutures we used were four. Total body weight loss at two months was 12%. At six months was 17%. At 12 months was 19%. This is the average total body weight loss. In some of our patients, remarkably, we have found that they had a total body weight loss of 25% at the end of one year. In none of our patients, we had serious adverse events. None of the patients required any surgical or any other interventional procedures for any complication. Uh, the average hospital stay was two. Nowadays, in fact, uh, more and more, we are inclining towards even sending the patient home on the same day. We don't even need to admit the patient if the patient is not very symptomatic. We just keep the patient for observation uh, in the hospital, in the recovery for a day. Now, this was as far as the gastric restrictive procedure, which can be done endoscopically. But endoscopy nowadays has also shown some reasonably good results in the treatment of the metabolic syndrome for the control of type 2 diabetes or for the control of uh, HbA1c. And you see here, uh, by concentrating on the abnormal enteroendocrine cells in the foregut, there are two procedures by which endoscopists can help. These are, of course, in the clinical trial stage. They are still not commercially available, very likely to come to India in the next few months or maybe a year. Uh, there is no doubt that these procedures will not be able to easily compete with the very robust and time-tested metabolic surgical procedures. But one of the procedures which we can do here is to simply bypass the foregut where the food does not come in contact with the abnormal endocrine cells which are lining the foregut. And thereby what happens is it increases the insulin sensitivity. And for this, we can just place a stent type of a tube starting from the pylorus, which goes right till the proximal jejunum, so that the food bypasses the duodenum, and by this we can achieve a reasonably good control of HbA1c. There were a number of papers which were published on this endobarrier technique, and you see here a reasonable control of HbA1c as well as the amount of insulin which was required by these patients. However, in the initial trials, the initial device which was invented, endobarrier, had some complications because of which the trial was withdrawn, and a new device now is under modification, which is likely to make an impact. However, there is another procedure where Professor Cummins is actively involved in the clinical trials, is called as the duodenal mucosal resurfacing, where endoscopically, we can actually change the lining of the foregut. We can change the abnormal enteroendocrine cells. And this is done by actually burning the lining of the uh, third part of the duodenum beyond the ampulla of waiter till the duodenal jejunal flexure by using this technique, which is called as duodenal mucosal resurfacing. A catheter is passed. And inside the catheter, there is a balloon. The balloon comes in contact with the mucosal surface of the duodenum. You put hot water inside the balloon, almost 90 degrees centigrade, by which the mucosal surface is ablated. And within a period of a month or so, new mucosa comes with new endocrine cells, and thereby you can achieve a good control of the HbA1c. However, there's another technique which can mimic a surgical bypass, and that is an endoscopic intestinal bypass, where we are using a hexagonal magnet like this, we can perform a jejunoileal bypass endoscopically. Now, this is how that procedure is done. This is also in the experimental stage where we can perform a side-to-side -side jejunoileal bypass. Now, you know that an end-to-end jejunoileal bypass had an extremely strong effect, but it used to cost a severe amount of malabsorption. But if you perform a side-to-side -side bypass, the malabsorption problem is taken care of, but at the same time, it can achieve a good metabolic control. We pass an enteroscope from up, an enteroscope from down, and here you can see we release two hexagonal magnets, one in the jejunum, one in the ileum, and literally within six days, these magnets come together, and the wall between the two magnets necrosis off, and there is an anastomosis which is formed between the jejunum and the ileum. You can see here, after the anastomosis is done, this is the endoscopic picture. You can see how it looks. 
this is the laparoscopic picture you can see how the jejunum has fused to the ileum and here this is the barium which shows how the contrast is passing directly from the jejunum inside the ileum so therefore friends ladies and gentlemen uh, i am here to tell you that that so called majority of the patients who do not want to undergo bariatric surgery for whom diet exercise is not going to be so easy probably this simple procedure of bariatric endoscopy is likely to meet the unmet need in the future as has been discussed by my previous speakers obesity is a very complex issue it is not only just a magic wand you just perform some procedure and you achieve the results lifelong that is not the case we have to remember that these procedures need to be followed up we need to augment them in the future and along with that we also have to have a good genetic structure and a good environment probably also a good uh, bacterial balance inside your gut so thanks for your attention and welcome to the future thank you now session is open for any questions or comments pardon they will fall off on their own what happens is once the anastomosis forms both the magnets stick to other stick to each other and they go out in the ileum and they go out out the stools they come out after doing their job yes uh, so one question from my side hi sir uh, so wonderful talk as always uh, one question sir like uh, when we are performing an endoscopy sleeve versus the laparoscopy sleeve are there any rcts to uh, for the comparison that is one number two sir the sleeve has always been for weight loss the metabolic complications are not that much reduced in sleeve even in laparoscopy sleeve so what is your take on that sir i'll answer the second question first the metabolic complications after a endoscopic gastroplasty are indirect that means because of reduction of weight there will be an improved uh, uh, metabolic balance for example many of our patients where we have performed the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty if they have lost say uh, 17% 20% of their total body weight they have a definite we have seen they have reduction in their requirement for anti diabetic medications many of their blood pressures have come under control they do not require any anti hypertensives most importantly we have found that their joint pains the knee pains have gone away many patients who could not even bend and touch their legs could easily perform a surya namaskar in front of me many patients many patients start walking which they could not do before so it has got a sort of indirect effects the, as compared to laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy it is less durable than the lap sleeve gastrectomy because we are doing an endoscopic suturing and sometimes our sutures are likely to open up but we can very easily go in and augment the sutures without subjecting the patient to another surgery so that is the big advantage second is there is absolutely no chance of any leakage so there is no serious adverse event there is no chance of mortality there is no chance of septicemia at the most you may have some collections around the stomach so do you do you feel that in endoscopy the leaving of fundus because we can't cover the fundus completely that is one of the very uh, big drawbacks uh, still uh, with the endoscopy therapy sir initially when we started the lap endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty we used to also suture the fundus because that is the way surgeons do they take out the fundus uh, the reason we stopped doing that is we found that the complications were high because of the short gastric vessels around the fundus and sometimes when we are doing a full thickness suture pulling the fundus inside the two towers we were damaging the spleen and then we realized that even by leaving in the fundus because of the reduced gastric emptying the food was preferentially staying on nuclear studies after esg procedure the food was remaining in the fundus the fundus was distending and that was enhancing the effect of our gastroplasty the patient was feeling much more uh, uh, less hunger less hunger the satiety improved so it was beneficial leaving the fundus inside any other question thank you so much sir i think you want to felicitate sir right yeah please thank you so much sir now i would like to request the chairpersons to kindly felicitate